Diamonds in a Dish, what does that mean to you? So when a Nobel laureate like Sidney, uh, he came up to me once and he said, what, what, we need to start studying humans in a dish. I, it took me by surprise. At first I was like, well, what does that mean? And he said, we need to stop studying animal models. We need to stop looking at mice. We need to stop looking at uh, using rabbits or anything else. We need to start using humans to st study human disorders. And that made sense to me. So after I came back from my, uh, after doing my PhD, I came back to Singapore and I, I went to him. He's one of my biggest my mentors. Sydney is also a visionary in science. Um, and he told me that, you know, we need to start looking at uh, studying humans. So I decided to embark on, on this concept. So humans in a dish is, uh, is basically the future of medicine. How, how amazing would it be to be able to cure genetic and neurological dis uh, diseases such as Alzheimer's using your own cells? So using this concept, I decided to look at the disorder known as Down syndrome. Now, why did I choose to look at Down syndrome? It's actually a very interesting disorder to study because the individual, scientifically speaking, because the individuals with Downs have several defects um, which make it interesting to look at. All this is due to an extra chromosome they have. So instead of having 46 chromosomes, they have 47 chromosomes. Now, annually, one in 1,000 births, um, annually worldwide, this is an occurrence that happens one in 1,000 births. And every year, about 30,000 kids in India are born with Down syndrome. And as I said earlier, this is due to an extra copy of the chromosome, and this onset occurs during prenatal development. So they have learning disabilities, they have uh, distinctive clinical features, such as a broad, eye, um, a broad forehead, they have slanted eyes, they have diminished muscle function, heart defects, which is one of the leading causes of their mortality, and they, interestingly, they develop Alzheimer's at a very early age, in their uh, late 30s. So um, currently, the treatment options available to them are mostly therapy, such as speech therapy, uh, occupational therapy, and certain type of drugs that can actually uh, slow down the symptoms of dementia and sort of drugs that can affect brain activity. But many of these are, are currently in their clinical trials, and they've not proven to be very effective. And most of them are poorly controlled, um, and they've revealed adverse effects um, from these treatments. So the only way forward seems to be we have to get down to the core of it. We have to get down to the chromosome, to the DNA, see what we can do from that point onwards. So hence brings the concept of chromosomal therapy. Now, what is chromosomal therapy, and how do we go about looking into the chromosome of these sort of disorders? So the, the best way forward with chromosomal therapy is using st stem cells. Now, just to give you a basic overview, there are three types of stem cells, ad adult stem cells, embryonic stem cells, and induced pluripotent stem cells. Most of you are, are very aware of the, the word embryonic stem cells, and these come from the embryo, and they can, they're pluripotent, which means they can be turned into any type of sense, um, stem cell you want to be. Now, induced pluripotent stem cells, on the other hand, is a relatively newer type of cell that, that has been manufactured, so to speak, recently. These are basically cells that can be taken from, let's say, your skin, and they can be reprogrammed. That sounds really cool. They can be reprogrammed into any cell type in, in your body, and they'll be turned into induced pluripotent stem cells. Now, why are they important? So these are basically patient-specific cell lines that can be created, and they can basically be turned into, as I said, any cell type you want it to be. You can take them from your skin, and then you can turn them into cardiomyocytes, heart cells, neurons, pancreatic cells, any type of cell type you want to look at a certain disease that are affected in these kind of cells. And, of course, you can improve drug safety from this. You have so-called a personalized medicine from these cells, and you can understand the molecular and cellular development of these disorders using these cell types. So how are they made in the lab? I mean, I'm talking about a concept here, but how, how do I actually translate it into the lab? So there, it's a pretty simple process. You isolate these cells from, let's say, your skin or from a fetal tissue, and then you add in these reprogramming factors. This would be some basically four transcriptional factors. And then, and then you select these cells, you expand them out, and then you have stable IPS lines. Now, this takes about 18 days to get these stable IPS lines. And once you have them, this is the overall project, overall method of what I do. So you actually, I take these amniotic fluid cells from pregnant women whose fetuses have been tested positive for, um, Alzheimer, uh, for Down syndrome, and then you expand them out, and then you get iPSCs, and then you turn them into neurons, and then you, look, you test for drug responses. And once you have these iPSCs and these neurons, you also have to characterize them. You have to make sure that they are pluripotent stem cells. 
And to do this, you can do um, immunostaining, and you can check the carrier type. So this is very important, because you can't just take any cell and say, OK, hey, that's an induced pluripotent stem cell. You have to make sure that they are pluripotent. You have to check that they're stable. If we eventually want to use this for therapy or clinical trials in the future, we have to make sure that they're pluripotent and they're stable. And if you put them into uh, humans, they don't form tumors, which is a big problem in iPSCs. Now, many, many a times when scientists talk and we, we, we talk about our work, we never get to show you how they actually look like when we're looking through the microscope. So I thought I'd give you guys a glimpse of how my cells look like under the microscope. This is the process of creating these iPSCs. So at day three, day six, day 10, they're pretty much like, they look like skin cells. And these are amniotic fluid cells. And then by day 14, you start seeing little colonies forming. And then by day 17, they start forming a bit bigger colonies. And, and by day 19, you have very nicely formed iPSCs. And then once I have my iPSCs, I turn them into neurons. And this is also done, this takes another 25 days. So as you can see, the whole process takes about two months. So the whole thing about scientists not really having a life outside the lab is very true. And there isn't, um, these cells pretty much become like your kids, your babies. You have to go in there every day, feed them. You have to like change the media. So it's a lot of hard work that, that goes on behind the scenes, even though these pictures make it seem like it's pretty simple. So once we have our motor neurons, again, we have to characterize them. You got to check that they're motor neurons. You can stain them for certain markers, and then you can check. And you can, of course, morphologically tell how they look like once you know how these neurons look like. So you get really beautiful images. And this is, at the end of the day, you know, what you're working towards, and you want to see them. And that's how it validates the research you do. So besides um, neurons, I also grow heart cells. So the heart cells, the amazing thing about heart cells is that they can actually beat in a dish. So you can see them beating like a, a normal heart in a dish. And what, the, the green that you see there is basically um, fluorescent. So that shows you where the heart cells are. And I remember when I first uh, saw these cells, I was amazed. I was amazed at how beautifully they beat in a dish. So wh wh what do we do once we have these cells? We have to do gene genome editing on them. Because, I mean, once we have these cells, we have to look, look into how this can be, uh, how we can look into the disorder from here on out. So we do genome editing on these cells. We repair these cells. And currently, we have a technology which some people already Scientists spoke about. Scientists have long CRISPR. imagined being able to make specific changes to the genetic code of a cell or organism. A revolutionary genome editing technology invented by scientists at UC Berkeley and Umea University makes this possible using an RNA-guided protein called Cas9. Cas9 searches through the cell's vast genetic material until it finds a sequence of DNA that matches the sequence of its programmable guide RNA. The guide RNA enables Cas9 to open the DNA helix, then to position two molecular blades to cut each strand of the DNA double helix. Repair enzymes seal the gap in the broken DNA, sometimes by inserting new genetic information supplied by the cell or the experimenter. In this way, disease-causing mutations can be corrected by changing the underlying genetic code. Scientists are now using this Cas9 technology for research applications in human health, agriculture, and bioenergy. This is an amazing technology. You can basically, the, the, the possibilities are endless. You can use this, this technology to sort of correct, in my case, the, the chromosome 21, which is, the, which is what causes the ex extra copy of the of, and Down syndrome. So the, this paper came out in 2012, which is a game changer in my field of research, where they've actually managed to correct the trisomy of these cells in culture. So what we do in our lab is we, we, we first create these iPSCs, and then we add this construct into the, into the cells, into the chromosome of these cells, and actually silences the third copy of the chromosome, eventually making the cells normal. So you actually get from Down syndrome uh, iPS lines, we turn them into normal cell lines. So obviously at this stage it's a proof of concept, but the possibilities are endless, because if, if we can actually be able to correct this Down syndrome in fetuses of mothers who have uh, fetuses that have Down syndrome, that would be amazing. So currently, I mean, in 2013, this has already been, iPS cells have already been used in monkeys. For example, monkeys that have Parkinson's, they actually got skin cells from monkeys, they turned them into iPSCs and then neurons, and they transplanted it back into the brains of these monkeys, and these monkeys actually showed diminished symptoms of Parkinson's. So it shows that these iPS cells do work in monkeys, which is one step closer to humans. 
And in 2014, last year, a Japanese scientist, Masayo Takahashi, was the pioneer um, scientist in using these iPSCs in humans. So she actually, in macular degeneration, which is an eye disorder which leads to blindness, she basically managed to produce pigment epithelial sheets using iPSCs, and she put, transplanted them into the retina of the eye. And the, the patient currently is undergoing this clinical, this clinical trial, and their, her vision has improved. But of course, it doesn't re completely um, repair her vision, but it has shown improvement. So this is a big step in iPSCs and show, to show that it can be used um, to, to cure human disorders. So at the end of the day, this is a very exciting technology. It's cutting edge work that we're, uh, that we're doing using iPS cells. And I think there is just so much that can, that can still be done uh, doing iPS cells. There's a lot of ethical issues that still have to be um, thought about. Um, but we've come a long way from where we were, um, let's say, 10 years ago, using these kind of cells to, to, to repair certain disorders like this. So if, even if I have a small part to play in, in making the, indiv the lives of these individuals easier with Down syndrome, I, I'm very happy to do that. Thank you.